The following video includes the senior design presentation by engineering students at the University of Wisconsin at Platteville. After that are questions and answers, and then photos and videos of the project. There we go, I got it. All right, so uh, sorry about that. Just a brief overview. Uh, we'll talk about the intro and get into like kind of the problem, kind of what was John, John Responsible was looking for. Uh, talk about our decision matrix, uh, some calculations we did with um, a student here called Evan. Uh, we'll look at the wire diagrams, CAD drawings, but we are mainly just want to show our building progression. Um, for this, he was just seeing if this was a new kind of like semester project, if we can finish this in time and kind of just trying to be carbon neutral and go all electric. Um, this is the tractor we used here. Um, it's a John Deere 2025R, um, and mainly using for his uh, company's hauling logs, um, just trimming. He can use this tractor for a lot of different aspects. Um, the motivation, like I said, uh, green energy, this main uh, diesel to electric conversion. You don't have to use the diesel, you just plug in the batteries concept and get her running. Um, yep, carbon neutral as well as uh, more power output was kind of the idea of this project using our Nissan LEAF batteries as we'll show in a later process. And electric, uh, this is growing, a growing, um, growing demand. Um, as said here, lawnmowers are made up of 29.7% uh, of the market and those are electric as well. Um, just uh, in general needs as like just beginning, what, what do we kind of need for this electric uh, tractor? Uh, electric motor for sure, the bottom left, um, an ME1003, we'll talk about that later. Um, a controller and of course batteries, um, we'll talk about our decision matrix on which batteries and motor to use. And also a BMS just to make sure our batteries don't go haywire and <laughs> blow up the tractor. <laughs> Yeah, so getting into a lot of the decision making and stuff here, uh, we'll go through the house of quality, our methodology, different motor options to replace what we have existing, um, battery options, and then also going through our decision matrix. So house of quality, when we were going through, we wanted to take into account all of John's customer requirements and kind of look at the different engineering characteristics that we wanted to touch on and kind of decide what was the most important. One of the biggest things that he wanted was a three hour long runtime. Uh, wanted to display the battery percentage so he knows where he's at when he needs to come back and charge, all of that, at ease of access of the battery. So instead of having to deal with a whole hidden kind of system, it's right there, easy to fix, easy to um, change. The fast charging is one of the bigger things too. Uh, a common voltage for the motor so it's easy to use. Um, the ability to run the tractor and the PTO together, so have enough power to do that. Weatherproofing and then also having throttle control. Um, we wanted to go through and pick a suitable motor based on the existing requirements that were given by the diesel motor to make sure that we're having an almost one-to-one -one or pretty much one-to-one -one change. Picking suitable batteries um, based on our decision matrix consulting with other people who have done this kind of thing before, and then also working from the top down, which means going and picking a motor and battery first, and then slowly working through all the other components that would work well with that system. So the existing motor, uh, motor was a Yanmar 3TNV80F. It's a diesel motor. Um, it had a rated power of 17.8 kilowatts, or roughly 23.9 horsepower, a rated speed of 3,200 RPMs, and at that rated speed, the torque was roughly 53.1 newton meters or 39.1 foot pounds. To replace a motor like this, which would have been what he had had to do, would be around three to five grand, depending on where you could find it and if you could find it. Some of the motor options that we had available to us, the very first one was the still forklift motor. It was originally used on the hydraulic pump and hydraulic system on a forklift. Um, it was free, that was the best thing about it right off the bat, but it, we had a nameplate with very minimal information and we didn't want to go making any kind of uh, calculations based on that and we wanted to see a physical um, motor curve so we could compare it to what we had. This next one is that ME1003 that Derek had brought up. It is a Mott Energy uh, electric motor. Um, we had found some of this online to kind of get into it and then also uh, ben Nelson here, uh, he had kind of given us a recommendation that that would be a pretty good option to go with. Um, it has 11 kilowatts of continuous power draw and has a 13 kilowatt maximum draw. Um, at 76 volts, 
um, it would be roughly between 3,600 and 3,800 RPMs. We wanted to keep between a 70 and 80 volt range for this motor to keep it at roughly the same RPM as the existing motor as well as the uh, torque, which here to achieve that 39.1 foot-pounds of torque, it would have roughly a 265 amp draw at its maximum to get to that point. Um, this motor also costs roughly 680 bucks. Battery-wise, uh, we had started out looking at the nickel metal hydride uh, Toyota Prius battery cells. Um, that battery pack in green that's there has a total of 38 cells in it. Um, each of those cells is 7.2 volt, uh, 6.5 amp hours, and based on the cost of the entire pack that we had found, it comes out to around $21.43 per cell. Um, after talking with Ben again, he kind of recommended going more towards a better battery that has quite a bit more capacity, which we'll learn later why that is a much better option to go with. Uh, so we started looking at the Nissan LEAF battery cells. Uh, they have 7.6 volts apiece, 45 amp hours, and they cost roughly $60 a uh, per cell, and that was buying a, uh, five cells together for $300. And then the Chevy Volt battery cells are 3.65 volts a piece, and they are 57 amp hours. Um, that pack right there has 288 cells in it, and from what we had seen, there were most options you would have to buy the entire pack. And that would came out to about uh, $8.68 per cell, so it seems like it's a lot cheaper, but you're also getting 288 cells. Um, going through and doing some of the calculations, we had talked with Evan Creedon as we were talking, and he kind of gave us a basic understanding of what we needed to be doing to calculate. And then uh, going through, we found some more research on the handbook of lithium ion battery pack design and chemistry components, uh, types and terminology by John Warner. We found these exact two um, equations in that book to kind of go off of what we had already talked about with Evan and what we had decided to go for. It's a pretty in-depth kind of um, spreadsheet here, but we went through and we wanted to keep between that 70 to 80 volts, which is how we were able to determine how many batteries were needed. Um, with the Prius battery, we'd want 10 of those to get us up to 72 volts. And based on the capacity and the uh, constant draw of the motor, we only get about 0.04 hours, which is about like two and a half minutes. So that is not good at all. And then we would have to go into even more batteries. Um, when we talk about bundles for this, uh, a bundle is 10 cells in series, and that is considered what we would call a bundle. And then going through and looking at either three, four, or five bundles running in parallel to get a higher capacity. Um, the Nissan LEAF, going through those would be 76 volts total, so uh, with the 10 batteries as well. Um, this would have a 0.31 hour um, run time just off of 10 battery cells. And as you can see, as we up that as well, getting up into more of the 40 to 50 cells in total, we'd get around an hour and a half. Um, onto the Chevy Volt, we got around um, 3.8 hours of run time. But as you can see, to get it up to 73 volts, we would need a total of 20 batteries as opposed to the 10 batteries that we were looking at before. Um, those going up more towards the 40 or, well, I guess in this case, it would be our 80 or 100 cells to get up to a four or five parallel bundle would get us around to 1.9 to one and a half, somewhere in there. So quite a bit more capacity, but you're also having to buy a lot more of the cells. So that's where we kind of get into our decision matrix. Then we're going to be talking about our process, which in this case, we went through the analytical hierarchy process, kind of determining what we needed to weight these options. We use the relative rating scale, which is seen here. That's essentially just how we compare two different criteria for the batteries. And then we also use the 11 point weighting scale, which is seen over there. And that's kind of when we get down to the more in-depth um, decisions, we're determining whether or not it's actually a good enough solution, which this is our entire uh, breakdown here. Up top, we kind of broke it apart where we wanted the battery. We wanted to look at the power, the chemistry going into it, and then the cost. And then going down even further, we want to look at the voltage and capacity, the um, different types of chemistry, which would be lithium, nickel metal hydride, or lead acid, and then the price per cell of a new and a used. Um, there's the C matrix here, which is what we used with that relative rating scale, and then using a normalized version, 
We were able to find our weights, which is the highlighted in yellow there, which is important for down here with our actual decision making. Um, down here, this is where we would use that 11 point scale to give it a score. Um, for instance, the capacity of the um, Prius batteries, we gave that a very low score because that is just not, not a good option. Whereas with the um, lithium ion cells, they both had very good capacity, so they got a relatively good score. Overall, going through and breaking it down, we found that the Nissan Leaf battery cells beat out the Chevy Volt cells just barely. So that's what we decided to go forward with. While I was busy swapping batteries for the camera, the students continued with the overview over the project with the wiring diagram, and then got into specific parts, including the DC to DC converter, which is sort of an electronic alternator, and the battery charger, and then the BMS. Down here is the BMS, or battery management system. The purpose of this is to keep all the batteries balanced at the voltages and make sure they don't overcharge or over discharge as well as protect them from higher low temperatures. And so this is hooked up to every battery positive terminal and measures the voltage on those batteries and then can send current to them from other batteries to balance them out. Up here is the main contactor which acts as a high voltage and high current switch for the battery to the motor and that is powered from the 12 volt system here. Here is the motor controller that we used. And so this maintains the motor speed through pulse width modulation. And it's programmable with other parameters such as torque and temperature. And you can control the speed of the motor with a dial on the console. Down here are some of the control switches that are used, such as a um, main battery disconnect switch. And that's mainly a safety feature, so you can just hit the switch. The main battery voltage is disconnected, as well as a latching relay from the key switch on the the, we use the original key switch on the tractor, so let's just turn the key on and turn it all the way to the right and the motor starts and release that and it stays on. And then there's also an e-stop to turn it off in case anything goes wrong. All right. So with all the cool components selected, we then got into the physical design of the tractor. So to start, we had to go and get everything into CAD. So we went to the tractor with a bunch of measuring tools got the whole thing into CAD, and then we started divining all of our important features and obstructions that we might have while moving forward with placing the components. So when placing the motor, the motor itself had some mounting holes and a centering feature, which helps keep the motor where we want it placed so we can have uh, alignment how we would like it to be. So to mount the motor, we took these motor mounts, or the plate mounts you can see in pink there, and those were tapped with a 3816 tap, and they were welded in place or made out of steel for high strength. For the motor plate itself, it was made out of half inch aluminum. The four upper holes are meant for bolting the motor to the plate, and that large hole is for the centering feature on the motor, so we could align the motor exactly where we wanted it to be. So when we came down to actually mounting the motor and getting it in place, we can see that our alignment was pretty good. We're about an inch off on center, and with our 16 inch drive shaft, that gave us about a four degree pinion angle. And the recommended is seven degrees to avoid pinion vibration. So that was a very nice thing to see. Uh, getting into the battery cradle, uh, we designed this system to stack two bundles of the Nissan Leaf cells on top of each other. So in red, you can see the main cradle, and that supports both sides of the batteries. And it also has lips in the front and the back to keep the bottom cells from sliding forward or backward. In green, we have the mid plate, which has some T-slot on the sides. So it keeps the bottom cell in place on the top, and it also holds the top cell in place. And then the yellow plate on top is to hold the uh, upper batteries down, so none of the batteries can move around on us. So now that we have everything designed, we get into the actual build part of it. So the motor mounts, you can see them up in red there. Uh, we got those welded in place. And with the motor installed, um, we had a little bit of a vibration um, in the motor when we put pressure on it. Uh, we did run FEA on the plate and found that at twice the load that we would normally see, we had 10 thousandths of deflection at the top of the plate. Um, but with uh, bouncing around in yards and stuff like that, we were concerned that it might fatigue the aluminum. So we put in a brace plate, which you can see on the bottom there. And that has a Delron block that sits on the bottom of the motor and keeps it from wanting to oscillate on us. So moving forward with the battery cradle, 
Um, this was all made out of heavy steel to keep weight on the front of the tractor. Um, everything was welded in place after we went through and removed everything that we didn't need on the front of the tractor, which were like the old motor mounts and some other brackets and stuff for the radiator, just things that were going to be in the way. So everything was um, welded in place. We still have yet to make the top plate. Unfortunately, at this point, we had a technical issue with the sound, so we couldn't hear the students. So we'll just continue straight from the PowerPoint for a couple of slides here. The next issue the students had to deal with was the drive shaft. They did reuse the original drive shaft, but they modified it a bit. They needed to make sure that it was the correct length. And then the yoke on the drive shaft was modified by boring it out to match the diameter of the electric motor shaft and cutting a keyway into it so the yoke could be installed and tightened down onto the motor. The students found that really the main components of the project were the motor itself, a main fuse, a main contactor, and then the motor controller, which controls the speed of the motor. The battery management system was mounted on a piece of acrylic, which also covers the battery terminals. There's quite a few wires that run to the individual cells of the batteries for balancing. And because all the current runs through the BMS, it also gives it the ability to completely shut down the tractor in case of low voltage. Besides the high voltage wiring, there was also 12 volt wiring that needed to go to existing components. This was all powered directly from the DC to DC converter with no 12 volt battery. This powers the lights, blinkers, hazards, and some other things, such as the relay that enables the PTO. Heavy duty cabling connected together the high voltage components, including the battery pack, the motor, BMS, and a dedicated battery shutoff switch. The conversion also needed some additional wiring, including the charger, the motor controller with a matching 0 to 5 kilo ohm potentiometer for speed control, the battery cutoff switch, and a dashboard mounted emergency stop button. The students also had to design a user interface, but since we fixed our audio issue, we'll let the students explain that to you. So here we have the user interface and we tried to reuse as much as possible from the existing tractor. And we only had to add the e-stop and the potentiometer for the throttle controls. So on the far left of that picture are the stock controls for the headlights, the blinkers, the PTO. All those still function as they would normally. Um, the red button is our e-stop and that takes and cuts the power to the contactor and will dead the motor as soon as you hit it. Uh, the potentiometer there is what controls our RPM so we can adjust speed based on um, the voltage that we see through the potentiometer so you can get your desired output for the PTO relative to your speed and so on and so forth. Um, not pictured here is the original ignition switch which is just like you would find in your car. So the whole tractor has no power when you turn the key to the on position the 12 volt system gets all of its power and then when you click over to the start position sends voltage to our latching relay and then enables the motor. So we went on to testing which was last Thursday um, under full throttle at full load, we got about 20 minutes of runtime, which was almost exactly what our calculations told us it would be. Uh, monitoring through the app that came with our BMS, we saw a max draw of about 125 amps, which is quite a bit. Um, our charge time is currently estimated about four hours. We haven't been able to sit down and go from zero to 100% charge due to limitations with the shop. Um, but with uh, the testing that we've done, we believe that four hours is, uh, is the right amount of charge. Yeah, so getting into some of our conclusions and stuff here, um, as we just talked about there with our testing and stuff, we found that calculation-wise, it was around 18 and a half minutes. And from our actual testing, we found it to actually be 20 minutes. So it ended up going the better direction that we, we were really hoping for, so that was good. Um, it also runs and drives. That's one of the biggest takeaways that we were really trying to get to at the end of this semester. So that was really good to get that. Um, some of the recommended and further testing that we would want to do is more of the actual torque from the motor and doing some more testing with that. And then we would also want to do runtime with equipment. And by that, I mean actually hooking this up to a mower deck and then actually going around and mowing a yard, seeing how long it really draws, maximum draw, all of that. And then also working on finding the um, RPM of the motor based on the potentiometer. We have rough positions on where we're at 
and what's minimum and maximum, but we would like to get a better idea of that so then we can truly um, get a better understanding. And then if for any reason he wanted to hook up a PTO, anything onto the PTO, it needs to be running at a set RPM, so we would want that to operate correctly as well. So some of the recommendations, uh, the photo tachometer, this is what we would use to determine RPM with, a, um, with the actual drive shaft itself. And then we would also be more uh, apt to put in the onboard BMS readout in an actual display rather than having to go onto your phone and look at the charge percentage or look at the maximum draw while you're driving it around. Um, we'd put in additional guarding too um, in the case of someone that doesn't know what they're doing and they come and find it and it's not switched off. We would rather have a uh, plexiglass, much like that the BMS was mounted to, surrounding it so that someone doesn't accidentally come in and mess with something they aren't supposed to. And we were also looking at adding more batteries. Um, as of right now, it's set up to where we could have 20 batteries total and then with the ease easy kind of addition onto that, we would be able to mount on more to do 30 to 40 more batteries. So that's something that we would definitely recommend too moving forward to get better testing when it comes to equipment and stuff as well. Um, here's kind of the total cost, um, kind of the main factor of this issue. Um, total cost was uh, 2000, about 2500 um, The main aspects that you can see in the top right, uh, motor was again like um, Set, we paid 745 and batteries for 600. Controller was the main app factor, as well as the BMS, which the BMS is kind of kind of convenient. As well as we said, it's Bluetooth. You can hook it up pretty easily through um, our uh, smart BMS app. You can see all 20 or 10 of the cells and see like which ones at what temperature, what voltage, what charging, and kind of have that kind of how long will this take the charge basically. It's also another thing to point out too is this thing with all of everything that we had just added into this came out to about 2500 bucks and to buy a new diesel motor that was ruined yeah, beforehand by someone else to replace that it was another it was three to five grand so we're coming underneath budget there in our mind of budget at least mm -hmm. so it's a feasible option to actually go through and change this out on an existing tractor. John had some connections for some of these, so yeah. <laughs> it was a lot cheaper, but yeah. yeah. For someone doing this on their own, this is the price that you'd want to look at. Yeah. yeah, so for the recognition for everyone involved in this process, we would definitely want to thank uh, Dr. Scott Moline for being our mentor for this project, as well as John Fick for being our sponsor for this. Uh, Evan Creedon for helping us out with some of those initial calculations and pointing us in the right direction. Uh, Mr. Ben Nelson for giving us some insight on some of the ex outside kind of factors and kind of seeing what it's like out actually doing this kind of thing on a regular basis. Uh, Kelly, Jeff, and Tom for being the shop supervisors and dealing with all the late nights that we were involved with. And then uh, Emmerich. Emmerich Machine Design. Emmerich Machine They're Design. Machining house that helped us get some of the more complex components made. Yeah. All right. So we have now reached the question section. If we want to take some in here, and then we can also go outside to the actual tractor too and kind of show everyone there and do questions out there as well. But for right now, we'll take a couple questions in here. Yeah. So you said you had room for more batteries. Is that like a linear? As you put in more batteries, you'll get that much more time? As you add 10 more, you'll yeah. Get so. When it comes to like the basic understanding of it with um, going through Ohm's law and looking at that, when you run things in parallel, the capacity or the amperage would increase while voltage stays the same. So with that in mind, when you put more batteries in parallel, you're essentially upping the capacity of the entire system. So the more battery packs like that that we could throw in there and we run them in parallel, the more capacity we would get. So with another, another 10 included, we go up to 90 amp hours, and then there, from there on forward as well. The testing was also done under full throttle, full load. Um, if you dial the throttle back or you're not under full load, you will have less consumption on the motor, which will increase your battery life. Yeah. Yeah. How fast does this tractor go? Uh, yeah. 12 miles an hour? Yeah. Downhill to tailwind. Right, so. <laughs> That's going down full gear, full PTOs, full throttle. But. Oh, yeah. We were, we were full open on that, and we got her up to 12. So we were pretty proud of that. Probably would have made it to the bars, but. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah, Sam. Um, in your guys' testing, how did you, like, did you experiment with changing the load at all? Like, applying load other than just changing the engine RPM? Uh, we did a little bit, but we weren't able to conduct a full test. Okay. So, the BMS readout on the app has a little bit of, you know, data that it gives you. That's where we saw the 125 amps. While doing our original driving around, make sure everything was functioning, we saw an average consumption of about 50 amps. So if we extrapolate that data a little bit, that's roughly 45 minutes on our current battery. And that was probably 50% throttle and low gear. Yeah, we did do some, um, some initial operation in low gear because uh, we didn't recognize it was in low gear. So we were just <laughs> motoring around in low gear, but mm -hmm. switched it into high gear and drove around with all four of us monkeys on it. And that's, that's, where, that's where we found that 125 amps going uphill with all four of us on it in high gear. So a bit more testing definitely needs to be done with that. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, there's a pretty small battery pack on here, so there's a limited run time because of that. But outside of that, how happy were you with how it turned out? I mean, would you generally say, it was very successful. What was your overall feelings on the project? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all kind of started with the controller. Uh, there's a light, kind of a light on the controller that says it'll flash red or like turn green. So we kind of, first we got to get that green light. Once we got that green light, we were all pretty excited in the shop. But yeah. that was a lot of working with voltages and it kept reading low voltage. And we're like, ah, I'm pretty sure we got enough voltages. But once we got all the wiring kinematics down and like the simple like, yeah, I would say it took about six hours of tinkering with the wiring before we even got a green light to turn on. All of us were about ready to like be done, and then we finally got that green light, and we're like, oh, all right, we can actually do something with this. And then messing around with some of the wires, we figured out how to actually start it. And when we started it, we we were very excited. <laughs> uh, we, we went and immediately started running it. We're overall, we are very happy with the fact that we were able to get this done in the time frame that we had and able to get more of the research done so that John and Future could do something more. So yeah, very happy. All right. Yep. Okay. Um, the battery life that you calculated is this to a draw, complete drawdown or to a particular limit? So this, this was essentially going down to a, I believe I had it in there at an 80%. So it wasn't a full like um, zero to 100%. This was, you don't wanna go within the, the low 10 or high 10 essentially percentage of the battery to keep it from wearing out. So we took that 80% of the, use that as essentially like a capacity factor and used that for our time. So essentially going only 80% of the actual battery life instead. Um, but when we came to actual testing, that's where we ran more into the, ran, run it from almost full to basically empty, essentially. So, so the controller yelled at us and said you should stop, <laughs> <laughs> basically. So yeah, it was, the calculations and stuff were essentially 80% of mm -hmm. the actual battery life that we could expect from just for an idea to make sure that we're within a good enough um, time frame. Yes, Sam. Um, compared to the diesel engine, like how does the electric motor and the batteries compare, like weight-wise? Uh, the the motor itself is only forty pounds, and the batteries themselves are, I think we said eighty. About eighty-five pounds. Yeah. yeah. So probably a couple hundred. And then we added probably thirty to forty pounds of steel, so we're about half of what the old motor was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We add on two more cell banks and some of the other wiring are close to what the original weight was. Yeah. But it's not like way over there. So. No, no, it's way under weight. Yeah. yeah. That's in, in the case of using it, he might want to buy um, some more like the tractor weights that you can put on the front just to make sure that we're not, not going into wheelie mode when we're <laughs> right. driving down the road. So you had one too? Okay. Yeah, this is a pretty specific question, but when you were comparing the batteries, you saw you had a category for the chemistry and for the mm -hmm. or something. Can you just explain what you were comparing between the batteries and what that category meant? Yeah, so we were wanting to, like, we knew that we had the lithium ion and the nickel metal hydride were two of the main ones that we were initially looking at. And when we were going through and comparing those, um, we essentially looked at what the actual, um, 
battery was itself, and then also like basic um, principles of like what each of those like can do. So obviously we looked at like the lead acid. We didn't include that in that calculation, but um, yeah, it was just kind of looking at each of the individual cells for the most part, not. That was kind of that pretty much like the discharge curve was the main thing we were looking at with the chemistry. So with a lead acid or a nickel metal hydride battery, you have a very even decaying curve. So you start to lose voltage almost immediately. Or with the lithium ion or the lithium polymer batteries, you keep that voltage pretty high towards the end of the battery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, otherwise, if you guys wanted to come outside, we're going to go mess around with it a little bit and show everyone if you wanted to stop by. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Thanks. <laughs>